Unafraid Show Mailbag Week 7. You guys, this is from you. These are the things that you've sent to I'm Mad at unafraidshow.com or you hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, anything at George Reister or at Unafraid Show because these are the questions that are burning in you guys' minds from this week in the world of college football. You guys, make sure that you like, subscribe, tell a friend about the Unafraid Show, and most of all, share. Share so we can continue to grow it and bring in you dope stuff. But let's get into it, into your questions and your comments. Number one, in Vanderbilt's upset of Alabama, defensive captain Malachi Moore slammed Diego Pavia's head into the turf, kicked the football, and drew a flag, threw his mouthpiece, then refused to come out of the game to cool off what would you do if you were Kalen DeBoer? Uh, Malachi Moore got to sit down for a minute, fam. Because first thing, yeah, I can understand everything else that happened. Like, yes, you lost your cool, kicked the ball, threw your mouthpiece, all sorts of things. There's going to be punishment for that, too. But it might be, you know, sitting you out for a quarter, a half. Could be you doing what we did in Oregon, which was 630s which where you had to work out at 6.30 in the morning and run 10 110s or roll or bear crawl or something like that, there would have been some punishment. But at the point in time where you defied the coaches and you like, I'm not coming out the game? Okay, all right. If I was Kalen DeBoer at that point in time, I would have calmly taken a penalty, getting you off the field. I would have walked over to you and they would have thrown a 15-yard penalty. Cool. I would have said, Malachi, check this out. Either you come off this field right now or you will never see this field again in this Alabama jersey. And he would have had a choice to make in that point in time. Now, to Kalen DeBoer's credit, you know, their defensive coordinator, they were like, oh, man, Malachi, he's been one of our biggest supporters since we've been here at Alabama. We love him. And I'm going to let you just listen to it. Obviously, from the press box, we can't hear what's being said on the field, but but it appeared from our vantage point that Malachi refused to be substituted for in the last minute. Can you clarify whether that was the case? Well, you know, um, you know, Malachi Moore, uh, I'm not sure anybody cares more about Alabama football than Malachi. Um, and, you know, in that moment, um, you know, when, when emotions are running high, uh, certainly, you know, there were, uh, he has been uh, held accountable, you know, for, for some of the actions and the penalty that, that incurred there at the end of the game. Um, I think Malachi's handled it really well with his teammates. Um, we are, uh, you know, uh, continuing to work to make sure that we address it the, the right way across the board. Um, but, uh, but I got to tell you, I mean, you know, when we first got here, Malachi has had our back from day one as a coaching staff coming in. He's been incredibly supportive. He's been a great leader for our players um, and, uh, and, and, you know, really uh, does things to the level and standard that we would want them to. Just in that moment, you know, I think got a little bit emotional. And so in that moment, we were going to try to settle him down just a little bit. Sometimes uh, those situations, it's better just to let them calm at a, at a later time. So, um, but again, I thought he handled, uh, has handled things really well since that point and uh, has, has, you know, taken the level of accountability that Coach DeBoer, you know, implemented and um, has, has done a really good job moving forward. See, the problem with this is, is that Kalen DeBoer is risking losing his entire team. Because if you let Malachi Moore get away with this and the locker room, now, mind you, they said there's internal stuff happening. He apologized. He put out a statement, all of those things. But none of that matters. If the people in that locker room, after they came from the disciplinarian with Nick Sabian, if they don't feel comfortable with the level of discipline that was displayed in terms of and that it's consistent with what has happened with the rest of the team, it ain't going to work. So Kalen DeBoer risks losing his football team and losing Alabama just in general if he does not get this right. So I'm not going to say that not suspending so I'm not going to say that not suspending Malachi Moore is the wrong thing to do. However, he better get this right. If Kalen DeBoer is wrong about how he handles this, this is going to be bigger than the loss to Vanderbilt in terms of this Alabama program. 
Next question up. Diego Pavia, the man we just talked about, hero, he has now a win over Auburn at Auburn while he was at New Mexico State and has beaten number one Alabama while at Vanderbilt. George, is this kid for real? All right. Yes, he's for real in terms of a competitor. He is for real in terms of having them, you know, them big balls and them types of onions that it takes. But you got to go back to how Diego Pavia was was made because he went to high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And there ain't a lot of big time players that come out of New Mexico. The one I can really think of off the top of my head is Bryant Erlacher. And then you got Diego Pavia, who tore it up at New Mexico Military Institute, which is a JUCO in Roswell. And then they won their first NJCAA championship in 2001 with Pavia at quarterback. And then he turned that and parlayed that into a scholarship at New Mexico State under Jerry Kill. And then about halfway through that 2022 season, they just let him loose and let him do his thing. They let him cook. And the team finished on a five and one run. And then in 2023, Pavia led the team to a, their first 10 win season since 1960. And that included that Auburn game where Auburn paid New Mexico State one point nine million dollars to beat them. Now, at that point, you would think, OK, that Diego Pavia would never actually have to pay for a drink in Tuscaloosa because he beat Auburn for the rest of his life but not no more though they're gonna make him pay double they gonna have to they're gonna need to go in witness protection and the kid ended up in vanderbilt out of the transfer portal after jerry kill and tom and tim beck took assistant coaching jobs in nashville under clark lee over there at vanderbilt and then that's when aria gerson at the tennessean he wrote just about how diego pavia was different now He's a competitor. You can just look in his face, look in his eyes, and he don't have that quarterback face thing going on because this dude was a high school wrestler. And how many quarterbacks actually wrestle? And the dude's mom is a savage too. She refused to talk to him after losses in youth football to teach him to hate losing. <laughs> Bro, mom was in on the gig too. And this is the same dude that body slammed an opponent against Auburn and got a penalty because he threw an interception on a free play when Auburn was offsides. And then his quote was actually hilarious. He said, once I step on the field, I'm going to dominate in every single way. I'm going to be the best player on the field every time I step on the field. And I absolutely love it. I love it. And I believe that he's already cemented himself as a legend in Commodore's history but they're three wins away from being bowl eligible for the first time in 2018. And if he does that combined with the number one, defeating the number one team in Alabama, not just any number one team, but Alabama, bro, the dude is a legend for life. All right. The third question that was sent in from you guys to unafraid show is um, Miami fan here. You talk about the full cam ward experience, which I've called it. Is that what we saw against Cal on Saturday? Yes, that is exactly what you saw. And what I mean by full Cam Ward experience is Cam Ward is a really good player and he's a excellent playmaker. And he's going to do some things that are going to have you wow. Like, oh my God, that was so special. The dude is clutch on fourth down. He makes plays. But the problem is as the level of competition increases, he has these like Will Levis intrusive mo moments thoughts. That is exactly what we saw against Cal uh, for Miami. There are going to be moments where Will Levis is spectacular, where he does things that you are just amazed at. The dude will be clutch on fourth down. He will be special. He will do all sorts of things that will leave you wow. But there are those moments once the big time competition comes up that his will levis intrusive thoughts will break through and he will throw an interception like he threw against cal where you're just as a fan just inexplicable shaking your head and just so upset i liken him to jr smith 
when J.R. Smith was with the Denver Nuggets. This is a dude that will shoot you in a basketball game, shoot you out of the basketball game, and more times than not, shoot the game winner and get you back in the game and win it as well. And that's the full Cam Ward experience. But the problem is, is that Miami, who has not played a ranked team yet and likely won't play a ranked team for the rest of the season, can he keep this this yo-yo up long enough for Miami to number one win the ACC and then if they get into the college football playoff be good enough and consistent enough that they won't lose a game because you know you play against better teams that margin for error against Cal if you get up on if Oregon Ohio State you know even Bama or Georgia if they get up 35 to 10 on you that's curtains buddy fourth question up what are your biggest concerns about this Oregon team? Will this be the first year that we've been ranked above number three in the AP poll since 2014? Ooh, that's a good question. That's spicy. My biggest concerns about this Oregon team. Number one, I'll say what they are not. They're not the defense. Defense has been good. Pass rush, uh, D-line, linebacker play has improved. The DBs have been pretty good. My only question about this Oregon team stands about this offense is there have been times where the offense has looked really good and there's been times where it's looked stagnant and you want to see this team in the second half because they've done it in the first half against UCLA, against Michigan State, but you want to see them in the second half be really good and lights out and be able to move the ball consistently. But the question is, in those games, did they use a soccer term and park the bus? Or did they, you know, or is there something that's in this offense that's not gelling at this point in time? But everybody has to remember that this 12-team college football season is different. It is different than any other year. It's the new normal season where a game against Ohio State, much like the, the Georgia-Alabama game, it's not a death sentence if you lose it. it, it your season's not over. You just want to be playing your best football like the NFL playoffs at the end of the year. You got to get in the playoffs and then you got to be playing your best ball if you want to be able to win. Because the expectation is not to be ranked above number three. It is to go deep in the college football playoff and try to win a national championship. Number five. Was Iowa better off with Brian Ferentz, Kirk Ferentz's son, their head coach, as the offensive coordinator? <clears throat> It sure appears that way, right? But then as we dig deeper down into the numbers of this thing, it gets a little bit interesting because in 2021, they averaged 304 yards per game, 17 first downs, and 23 points a game. Last year, 252, 14, I'm oh, sorry, in 2022, it was 252, 14 first downs, and 18 points per game. 2023, 235, 13 first downs per game and 15 points per game. And that was last year, which was Brian Ferentz's since last year. And that was absolutely pitiful. But now at this point in time through, you know, through week six, 363 yards per game, 14, no, 18 first downs per game and 27 points per game. Now I'm going to tell you this. These numbers are going to fall dramatically because this offense is bad. They will be way under 27 points per game because they're getting into Big Ten play and they're not going to score in the 30s outside of that Minnesota game where Minnesota's turnovers just led to a bunch of, of, of empty calorie points. So, yes, this offense is essentially the exact same thing. And they hired Tim Lester to be their new offensive coordinator and it appears to be a little bit of an upgrade. But their head coach, Kirk Ferentz, it seems like he would rather win and score three points than lose and score 30. But we look at last week, they were never going to beat Ohio State. But isn't it possible, considering that Vanderbilt beat Alabama, couldn't you make it a little bit closer? And yeah, they probably should have beat Iowa State, who's ranked in the top 15 right now. And it probably is not Tim Lester's fault that Kirk Ferentz decided to play run and punt football at the end of that Iowa State game. 
But I do not believe that there is any offensive coordinator in the country that's going to be able to overcome Kirk Ferentz style of play because he has his thumb on his offensive coordinator. And the numbers show that I was made some progress, but we won't know for sure until we watch them in Big Ten play. But but my sneaky suspicion is that it is still just as bad as it was. All right, next thing up. Uh, Number six, why is Boise putting, and they're talking about Boise State, why is Boise State sitting Ashton Genty when they should be padding his stats for Heisman voters that definitely don't watch Boise State games? I thought this when they played Utah State this week because Ashton Genty in the first half had 13 carries for 186 and three touchdowns. I was like, damn, this dude might go for 300 today. And on one hand, no, they should not be doing that because Ashton Genty is the reason why they're winning and in the top 25. And a sprained ankle, a weird tackle, something happening to him because you're playing him in garbage time is not a good idea. But think about, but then I was like, damn, you're putting him in danger. But then let's look at how the last Heisman, two Heisman trophies were won. Because last year, Jaden Daniels won. And over a third of Jaden Daniels combined passing and rushing touchdowns from last year came against a combination of Grambling, Army, and Georgia State. A third of them. And then you, the year before, Caleb Williams, the dude had touchdown passes in 2022 against Rice while the team was already up 45-17. to 17. And then Fresno State, when in the fourth quarter, when they were up 35-17. to 17. Now look at what uh, Nick Saban did with Bryce Young. He didn't leave Bryce Young late into games. If he had, he would have been arrested because Bama fans would have gone crazy. And you actually have a short memory if you're looking at Bryce Young right now. Oh, so he wasn't that good in college. Nah, it was a whole different story. But on the flip side, though, Aston Jeans, he's not playing at Alabama. He's playing at a group of five school in Boise State. And I would not blame them for getting Jinty to 20 carries instead of pulling him at 13 when you know that you want a Heisman Trophy up in that up in your in your team center. And as you are going to be changing conferences, heading over to the Pac-12. So this is one of them important things for the university. So, listen, we just got to I would be playing them just a teeny tiny bit more in that Utah State game and just praying for them. Number seven. This is a UC, well, (laughs) number seven, this is a USC question. And I know that USC fans are going to be, oh, George, you're a hater. Listen, this came from y'all. This ain't me. Lincoln Riley is five and seven in his last 12 games. Clay Helton was eight and four in his last 12 before getting fired. Should USC fans be patient or do they need to start thinking about the future? And honestly, if we're being honest, the only reason USC isn't four and eight over that span is because Cal didn't get a two point conversion after scoring with less than a minute left to make it 50 to 49. And that Arizona game where they didn't get their two point conversion too. it could be nasty, could be nasty. I believe when I watch Lincoln Riley, he is a good football coach. This is the first time that he actually cared about defense because he kept his friend Alex Grinch employed for so long, and he thought that the offense was so great that it was going to be able to overcome the defensive struggles. And now I believe he's learned that lesson. But the problem is is that football is a results-based business, college football and the NFL. So, yes, USC fans are like, yes, we were ranked, and now they're upset that they're not ranked. So I don't think that you paid, you know, Lincoln Riley a hundred million dollars to not be ranked in his third year in the program. I don't think you did that. And now they got Penn State coming into town. If they lose this game to Penn State, they're going to be three and three with a lot of games left, including Notre Dame left on the schedule. So this is not going to go over well with USC fans and USC people, but I would exercise caution because number one firing Lincoln Riley with this contract that's going to be way expensive 
And number two, he's shown that he's committed to defense. So maybe he needs one more year to figure it out with a new quarterback, get the recruiting rankings together. So I would not be even thinking about the future until after next season. Uh, Number eight, can my BYU Cougars win the Big 12 just one year after going two and seven in conference play? It appears that way, right? Because Big 12 media voters, they need to look a they need to take a long look in the mirror right now because five of the teams that got first place votes are a combined three and nine in conference play right now. While the five teams that are undefeated in conference play were voted sixth in Iowa State, seventh in West Virginia, ninth in Texas Tech, eleventh in Colorado, and thirteenth in BYU. And BYU is sitting at five and zero right now with a win at SMU. And that looks better and better every single week. And people thought, and remember, I put Kalani Sataki on the pressure list, not on the hot seat, but on the pressure list coming into this season. And he's delivering so far. And, you know, because everybody was looking at that Zach Wilson season, well, those two, and saying, oh, my God, like, yo, those might have been just COVID related. Well, nope, the dude's a good coach, and he has found a way to rebuild this roster and put it back together. And he's also getting contributions from everywhere on the team. No feature back, no problem. The Cougars have seven interceptions on the year, but no player has more than one. Eight different dudes have a sack. Eight different players have a receiving touchdown. And you never know whose turn it is on a week-in and week-out basis to contribute. But the question is, are they tougher and better than Iowa State? We'll see. Is Colorado uh, going to have a, a coach prime coach of the year type of year. Cause we're not going to find out if they're better than Iowa state, unless they meet in the big 12 championship. Can they stop Colorado's passing attack? We won't know unless they meet in the title game because they're not on the schedule because Colorado does have a friendly schedule. When you look at it, you cannot tell me that 12 and 0 is impossible for this team. They even get Utah, which is their biggest rival in the Holy War coming off a of bye. So they got plenty of opportunity to have a great season. Ninth question up. What up, George? Big fan from the Steel City. Why isn't anybody talking about Eli Holstein and his 1800 yards of offense and 18 combined touchdowns? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to it aside from he ain't the sexy name right now. And Pittsburgh is not the usual, you know, situation that we're talking about right now. And his team is not ranked. But this Alabama transfer, who I got a chance to see participate in the Elite 11 in 2023, up against guys like Jaden Rashada, Malachi Nelson. Um, Yeah, the dude was impressive. He's a hell of an athlete. I think he won their, their, like, their spark test or whatever the metric is there. And he was absolutely elite at it in terms of being big, fast, strong, and being able to throw the football at a high level. And he didn't even go to ACC media day because he wasn't expected to start. But now four consecutive ACC rookie of the week honors to start his career. The dude has been absolutely impressive big time yardage when he's gotten a chance to play it is touchdowns everything in between and he's doing a good job of taking care of the football so while you're not hearing about Eli Holstein right now you will at some point in time this season as you should but the thing about Pittsburgh is is that there are going to be heavy hitters coming for Eli Holstein after this season. So y'all better hit up your donors, turn turn their pockets upside down, start shaking them. We need all the cash to be able to keep this young man. But he's already transferred from Bama, and this does not mean that he's going to leave Pittsburgh because he. this is where he got a shot. And sometimes quarterbacks, they get in the transfer portal looking for more money or a better situation. But this is a kid that's headed to the NFL at some point in time. And he may say, listen, things are good here at Pittsburgh. Why risk it and go somewhere else with some people that I don't know like that? So that may be an option for the kid, too. All right. Question number 10. George, you always talk about how inconsistent targeting calls are. What is your verdict on the 
calls from this weekend. One of the biggest ones was from the Miami game this weekend versus Cal and a non-call on a Fernando Mendoza hit. I have stated for a long time that there should be two levels of targeting, targeting one and targeting two. That targeting one, if you get more than one in a game, you're out for the game. And honestly, I'd sit you next week. Because now you're being a little bit reckless. But targeting two is when you clearly violate it and it is a reckless play or a dangerous play. Because there are some physics involved in football. If you are going to have somebody running at you full speed, there is no way for you to tackle somebody to generate the level of upward force that you need to be able to get somebody on the ground without getting your head involved And sometimes there is incidental contact. Or if you're going at an angle, you got to get your head across. So there's no way for you to get your head across without your head going down on some level. There there are natural physics to it. And when I hear people talking about targeting calls, they're like, oh, he put his head down. Fans on the internet. It drives me bananas. I'm like, have you never played football before? Do you not understand how physics works, how your actual body works? You can't keep your head back and keep your chest up and generate enough momentum to get somebody stopped. It's not possible. And if 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 you're going at somebody, you have to get lower and there's no way to do that and keep your face completely up. It it is impossible. So, yes, there are some times where incidental contact happens. And here's the, the, the phrase that everybody needs to understand. This is football. Bad things happen to good people sometimes. That doesn't mean it's a penalty just because somebody got hurt. And you guys, that's the Unafraid Show mailbag. Make sure that you send your questions in. I'm Matt. I-M-M-A-D at unafraidshow.com or at George Reister or at Unafraid Show on Twitter, Facebook, Threads, wherever it is that you want to send them in and we will absolutely get to it.